The year is 2004. I am six years old, Spider-Man 2 is about to come out in theatres, and my mum just bought me the movie tie-in game for the PlayStation 2. So obviously, once I get my little hands on the game, I fire it into my console, patiently waiting for it to start. But little did I know that I was about to experience the godfather of all Spider-Man games. The combat was extremely satisfying, if not oddly violent. The story certainly had its moments, despite Mr. McGuire's lackluster voice acting. Uh. I'm so sick of everyone hating me. And the side activities really made me feel like a pizza delivery driver. But realistically, the thing that everyone remembers this game for is of course the revolutionary web swinging, a momentum-based reversal system designed by our boys at Treyarch, which instantly put Spider-Man 2 in the movie tie-in game Hall of Fame. Although it was pretty empty at the time. You wouldn't think it looking at it now, but this game was an absolute technical marvel when it came out, setting such a high standard for Spider-Man games to come, and while some definitely matched those expectations, as the years went on, the quality of these games really started to decline. Evidently, Spider-Man games had fallen on some really hard times, and it fully felt like we would never get a modern Spider-Man game that was on par with Spider-Man 2. But then at E3 2016, it was announced that Insomniac, a company best known for the Ratchet and Clank franchise, would be working on a brand new PlayStation exclusive. Trust me when I say, the hype around this new Spider-Man game was monumental, each new trailer racking up millions upon millions of views, with so many fans hoping that Insomniac could do with Spider-Man what Rocksteady did with Batman. Then eventually, in late 2018, Spider-Man PS4 finally hit the shelves, and while Xbox players clutched their copy of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, PlayStation players had the opportunity to become Spider-Man. Safe to say, the game was universally adored. Its story was incredible from start to finish, taking beloved characters we've seen multiple times before and reincorporating them in different interesting ways. Its combat was great, giving you a variety of web gadgets to play around with, as well as each unlockable suit having a cool special ability. But most importantly, the web swinging had every Spider-Man fan lost for words, because our boys Insomniac had done the impossible. Finally, we had a game that completely exceeded the expectations set by Spider-Man 2. Seriously though, Insomniac knocked out the park of this game, gaining rave reviews, tons of sales, and somehow it wouldn't be long before they gifted us with another absolute banger, Spider-Man Miles Morales. Announced as a PS5 launch title, Miles Morales was an expansion focused on Miles becoming his very own Spider-Man rather than just looking like a member of his fan club. See, Insomniac had done a great job introducing him in the first game, and now it was time for Miles to shine. From designing his own suit to taking down a corrupt company known as Roxxon, the game delivers a wonderful story showing just how far Miles has come and that he's more than capable of being Spider-Man. Although, why is Topher Grace in this game? Hey, you know, I'm Tom Cruise. Oh, and uh, if you're wondering where Peter is throughout all of this, I think he goes on vacation and gets a slight facelift. Admittedly, Miles Morales may have been a little bit on the short side, clocking in at around seven hours, but clearly that didn't matter, because much like its predecessor, the game received fantastic reviews, nearly got GameSpot cancelled, and I'm sure made Sony even more money in PS5 sales. However, I will say it contains the most unnecessary backflip in gaming history. So now, with two fantastic games under their belt, and multiple awards for both of them, Insomniac quietly snuck back into the shadows to start work on their next game. Fortunately though, we didn't have to wait long, because during PlayStation Showcase in 2021, we got a little taste of what's next. But first, ad time. Have you ever walked into your local video game store and had the sad realisation that there simply isn't anything to play? That nothing will fill that gamer sized hole in your heart? Well then buy one to dead, you idiot. Have you ever heard of Dead or Alive and Ninja Gaiden? Um, shut up, of course you have. And the developers behind those games have came together under a new publisher to give you Wanted Dead. A gloriously retro cyberpunk styled game which embodies the spirit of beloved PS3 and Xbox 360 era classics as you run around mowing down enemies with this katana, a variety of guns, and over 50 lovely combos. Plus, while you run around dismembering the locals, you can listen to the game's soundtrack, which is an absolute banger. But most importantly, if you get tired of cutting through entire armies or or fighting giant robots, you can just relax with some good old karaoke or eat these lovely noodles while you try to repress the traumatic memory of killing thousands. 
Anyway, time to get back to that good stuff, baby! Now, unfortunately, somehow Wanted Dead went unnoticed by the gaming community, which is honestly a crime because just look at this insane gameplay, which can only be accurately described as hack and slash kung fu. Whether it's gruesome brutal combat, a fun story, or you just want to explore a mad cyberpunk world, Wanted Dead is definitely the game for you. It's available for PC, PlayStation, or Xbox, and if you pick it up right now, not only do you get 30% off, you don't even get 40% off you get 50% off. But you better be quick because the sale is only active on Steam until January 4th. The developers have also just released the first patch for the game on PC, improving your gaming experience dramatically with it set to hit consoles in just a few weeks. Clearly now is the best time to pick up the game. Just use the link in the description or the pinned comment and jump straight into the insane world of Wanted Dead. Obviously, this trailer got fans a little hyped, especially with the reveal of Venom sending everyone into a frenzy because that meant we're getting the symbiote suit. Like, I've been a massive fan of both Venom and the symbiote ever since it appeared in the 90s animated series. I mean, I can still hear Christopher Daniel Barnes voice acting just thinking about the show. Venom himself has been an incredibly popular character since his initial debut back in 1988 when he scared the shit out of Mary Jane. Since then, he's been in multiple different Spider-Man stories, had a plethora of different comic book runs, featured in almost every Spider-Man cartoon, starred in free movies of various quality, and he's also appeared in various different games. Most notably, he was a playable character in the Ultimate Spider-Man game, which was based off the comics of the same name, hence the comic-inspired art style. The game seen you switching between both Peter and Eddie as it followed on from the events of Venom's Ultimate Comics introduction. It was also, again, developed by Treyarch, so obviously you know our boy's cooked here. Perhaps his second biggest appearance though was in Spider-Man Web of Shadows, where Treyarch joined forces with Shabba Games to give us a Spider-Man game that had an incredibly in-depth combat system and, uh, incredibly bad voice acting. Did I just get drafted? Anyway, with all this anticipation for their upcoming game, Insomniac decided the smart thing to do was not say another word for a year and a half leaving fans with only a release date and this screenshot. Thankfully, by May 2023, we could burn that screenshot because Insomniac finally gave us some new footage, and this time, it was actual gameplay. Showcasing the new web wings you could use to glide across the city, the lizard in all its scaly glory, the new combat system, and of course, the black suit. Damn. I'm looking good. Then after this video dropped, it was like the floodgates opened. A limited edition PS5 was showing off, a story trailer arrived in July, a video with creative director Brian Intahar talking about all the new features quickly followed that, and of course the collector's edition was finally revealed all 19 inches of it, for a reasonable £220. So after all this hype and build up, October 20th finally rolled around and as my collector's edition arrived and I held the game in my hand, I was actually a little nervous. What if the game doesn't live up to the previous two titles? What if I've gone bankrupt over 19 inches of Venom? And what if Spider-Man 2 isn't good? Thankfully though, I was proven wrong with this insane intro. <laughs> From the very moment I picked up my controller and pressed start, I was absolutely hooked, and for the next two days I was locked in my room playing this fucking game until I got that platinum. I don't know man, it just felt so good to finally be swinging through New York again, exploring this beautiful city and seeing how it's evolved from the first game. Like we've now got people protesting outside Oscorp, an abundance of street art, conspiracy theorists in Central Park, an ungodly amount of traffic, these lovely gentlemen, and of course, huge fucking rats now with ray tracing. I fully felt immersed in this open world, which made the enhanced web swinging even better as I could just open my web wings and glide across the city at a ridiculous speed. Although unfortunately, the sheer speed of the web swinging here has made me never want to play the previous two games again. The only thing that did take me out of that immersion was when I turned the web assist off and fall damage on and then tried to do a dumb trick. However, in saying that, I suppose turning into a cube halfway through the game was a little immersion breaking. That got patched pretty quickly though after a few tweets. To be fair, I did experience a few glitches here and there, with some being pretty funny and others being really fucking annoying, like getting trapped inside a giant rock. I can definitely look past these bugs though because this is the first time I've played a PS5 game that has actually felt like a PS5 game pushing the tech to its full possibility. I mean just look no further than the opening fight with Sandman, you cannot tell me this isn't a massive flex by Insomniac. Also on that note I would like to say to that one guy who tried to play it on his PS4, I salute you my dear friend, now please turn it off before your PS4 combusts. Now this of course wouldn't be a Spider-Man game if you couldn't beat up criminals, and for the most part the combat in the previous games was super fun, as long as you ignore those medical bills. I mean, Miles had his Venom powers and Peter had his various web themed gadgets, which is personally one of my favourite aspects of the first game. So of course, Insomniac got rid of half of them. Oh, no. 
<laughs> now to be fair, Brian Intahar said the reason for this was to not make these characters feel too overpowered. So instead of having gadgets like the web bomb and the impact webbing, you've now got a fucking drone. Fire all the drones! It isn't a huge loss, but it absolutely makes Miles a more interesting character to play as for a while, until Peter gets the black suit, and then it's demon time. The symbiote powers in this game are completely insane, which translates nicely into the story, as I can understand why Peter would be reluctant to give it up, because how else am I going to make enemies regret their life choices? Honestly, from a gameplay perspective, it feels like Insomniac has basically improved everything here. Like, remember how much everyone hated the MJ missions in the first game? Well, Insomniac's senior criticism said fuck you, put them in this game, and somehow made them good by giving MJ a gun. I mean, there's a mission called Wake Up, which you play as MJ, that genuinely might be the best mission in the entire game. It takes place when the symbiote really begins to take a hold of Peter. Destroy us? Not just turning him into Bully Lowenfall, but instead making him a horrifying slime monster. So to further illustrate the suit taking over, you play this mission as MJ, and despite being military trained now, you can't help but feel helpless moving through the level and seeing the destruction being caused by Peter, ultimately ending when MJ confronts Peter inside a blocked off tunnel. She approaches him, but strangely he appears to be asleep, so in an effort to wake him up, MJ shocks him, which appears to work, only for Peter to say this. Run. I don't think you have any idea how fast I really am. The side content here is also pretty great. Sure, there's some repetitive ones like taking pictures of weird things in the city, but then you have some absolute gems like the flame side missions where Cletus Cassidy runs a fire cult and then steals a symbiote. I'm carnage. Or there's Marco's memories, which help to give more context as to why Marco was turning New York into a sandcastle. Honestly though, I really liked the more simple ones like Photo Help, a side mission where you help an aspiring photographer and reminisce about your e-boy haircut. Missing Grandpa is an emotional gut punch I was not prepared for as you sit down with Grandpa Earl and talk to him about love, death, and the long-lasting memories we create with others. And of course, we have the beautiful Howard side mission, where you help the lovely homeless man from the first game rehome his pigeons, and then nothing else happens, I swear. Now, as I mentioned, I played through this game in like two days, and it wasn't until I finished it and actually took the time to process everything that I had just played to get me to come to this conclusion. <clears throat> The story is a little bit of a mess. See, there was massive expectations for this game before it was even announced, and for the most part, it seemed to meet them, doing extremely well with critics, ranking as the third best superhero game ever made on Metacritic, and becoming the fastest selling game in PlayStation history. Even despite some rather strange videos, it seemed to be adored by fans too, which is why I feel like a crazy person when I sit here and say, this story to me felt so unbelievably rushed, like we were on a speed run to get to those 19 inches. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's so much here to love, and Spider-Man 2 is undoubtedly a good game, having some fantastic moments that will stick in my brain forever. Like how this time, they can actually cut carrots. Oh, fuck with me. Craven was a particular highlight for me. Drawing inspiration from the masterpiece that is Craven's Last Hunt, Insomniac's version of this character is a man who cannot accept his own death, and would much rather search for a worthy opponent who can end his life in a manner he wants. He is a fascinating character who forces villains to fight him to the death, viewing each hunt he survives as a disappointment rather than a win, because ultimately, Craven is running out of time. The man is a bit of a freak too. Miles also has an especially satisfying arc with Martin Lee. Clearly wanting some sort of vengeance for Lee's actions in the first game, Miles becomes consumed with getting revenge, neglecting everything else in his life, like his college essay. Ultimately though, Miles learns that holding onto the hate he has for Martin is what's holding him back, learning that while he can never forgive Lee for taking his dad away, he can let go of the hate he has for him. It's moments like this that really justify those review scores. Like the entire symbiote arc has some unforgettable moments, but a clear standout is Yuri Lonefall's voice acting, which turns this PS5 game into pure cinema. I need this suit. It makes me a better Spider-Man. You just want it for yourself. I really hope he wins performance of the year. Neil Nubar. However, unfortunately, I feel like none of this stuff gets any time to cook because the main story is only like 15 hours long and we need to keep this train going, with this issue only becoming more apparent when it comes to the main antagonist. 
Now, as most of you probably figured from watching the trailers, Harry Osborn is finally back from his trip across Europe, or uh, alternatively, being stuck in a giant tank full of black goo, which is kind of like going to Britain, to be honest. He's the initial host for the symbiote, as it's preventing him from, well, dying. But as the game progresses, we see that the symbiote would rather be with Peter, resulting in it leaving Harry and bonding with him. This obviously isn't good, because Harry's pretty much dependent on the suit keeping him alive, but the more time Peter spends in the suit, the less he wants to give it back leading to Harry looking like a Dark Souls NPC with a pill problem. Eventually though, after a brilliant boss fight, Peter tears off the symbiote and tries to return it to Oscorp. However, the symbiote has other plans and latches back on to a very disgruntled Harry Osborn, creating Venom. And honestly, when I seen you could play as Venom for the first time since Ultimate Spider-Man, I can't lie, I was a little hyped. It's a great introduction to this character, showing off how powerful he really is, ending with Venom finally giving Kraven exactly what he wants. But after this point, it felt like we were back on that speed run because suddenly MJ is Scream, Peter has the anti-venom suit, and Harry's turned New York into Web of Shadows 2.0. Again, none of this stuff is bad, but the game moves at such a breakneck pace, it's difficult to really take any of it in, shifting the focus from what should be the relationship between Harry and Peter to, oh no, I guess New York's going into another lockdown. Not another one? Honestly, it feels like Venom would have been so much better if he was given like five more hours. I mean, the final boss fight with Harry is an emotional battle between two best friends, it's brilliantly performed and makes my heart very sad when Peter is faced with the possibility of losing Harry all over again. Plus, he even dunks you here. But as I laid those final punches in and Peter destroyed the symbiote, I couldn't help but think that there's still so much stuff which could have been explored with Venom. Like even Tony Todd himself said that they only used like 10% of the lines he recorded. So where's the rest of it? Again, don't get me wrong, this final boss fight hits all the emotional beats because we've seen this friendship evolve over the course of the game. But as far as Venom goes, he could have done with five more minutes. Despite any of the issues I've just said with this game's story, I think it's pretty clear that it definitely left an impact on me that I won't be forgetting anytime soon, regardless of how bad this Adidas branded suit is. What the fuck are you wearing? Seriously though, Spider-Man 2 is still a fantastic experience. There is so much love and care put into every aspect of this game, from the gorgeous suits to the breathtaking visuals. Sure, it isn't a masterpiece, but Insomniac has such a clear passion for this character, it's infectious. Like this game and the series in general is such a high point for the character, who let's be honest, definitely need it considering the state of Spider-Man games prior to Insomniac picking up the license. They understand that being Spider-Man is hard, it means doing the right thing even when it hurts, not giving up on people despite their past and ultimately sacrificing sacrificing so much to protect the people around you. But perhaps most importantly, Insomniac understands that being Spider-Man doesn't mean you can't also live your own life, because while it isn't easy to maintain, all you really need is a bit of balance. Balance is a process, not a destination. you took from me. I need this suit. It makes me a better Spider-Man. 